ordinary meet the little woman fans. Welcome to the first R-rated episode of the Little Woman channel. There's going to be some major content, so listener discretion is advised. There will be talk about sex. Sex in the 19th century. In the first season of this podcast, I made an episode called Love and Sex in Little Woman, where I discussed about the way the Victorians began to connect sexual attraction to romantic love and marriage. Sexual attraction and romantic love, they have of course always been going hand in hand. But in the 19th century, that is when people started to connect that to marriage. And when I made that episode, somebody left a comment saying, Yes, there is love in Little Woman, but sex? I don't think so. And I was like, hmm, give this episode a go and then come back and tell me if there was sex or not. The confusion is understandable because in the 19th century, people were not allowed to talk about sex. And when I speak about sex here, I, I don't only mean the thing itself, but any kind of physical interaction, such as kissing or making out or just holding hands. For the Victorians, it was not appropriate to show any kind of physical interaction or speak about anything of that sort. They had to use euphemisms when speaking about these things. In Little Woman, when there is the sex scene between Meg and John, it is written with euphemisms. Meg and John have a, quote, moment of bliss, and then Meg opens the door wearing John's shirt. Then there is the scene that I always read as an afterglow scene in Little Man, <laughs> where the narrator says that Friedrich and Joe found their, quote, truest rest and happiness from each other's company. I have read some really bad analysis on Joe's and Friedrich's relationship. People saying that Joe must be an asexual, or that Friedrich must be an asexual, and these people base these assumptions to this idea that why would Joe say no to quote, sexy and erotic glory and marry an asexual man. And Greta Gerwig said something similar to this, how could Joe say no to the handsome glory slash Timothy Chalamet? And they explain it saying that Joe must be an asexual or gay, or Friedrich not being an a sexual person at all, just because Joe rejected Laurie, which doesn't make much sense. It is frustrating because you will get the feeling that these people haven't read the novel at all. This is a quote from Christina from Under the Umbrella Block. Gerwig tried to make something Little Woman isn't because she did not like Little Woman, and she might as well have made her own story rather than mangle an already beloved story and get people to believe misconceptions and myths that totally twist the public's idea of what the story is and its characters really are. End quote. A lot of the Joe and Friedrich discourse seems to be based on that. I recently read an essay which handled Laurie's masculinity, and it once again had, quote, Joe married an, an older asexual man. Friedrich is written to be 39 in the novel, when Joe meets him in New York, and he's attracted to her and Joe is attracted to him, but because of the social restructures of that time, they cannot directly express their interest, and if Pet would not have become ill, Joe would have stayed in New York a lot longer, because they don't argue in the book like they argue in the films. They are friends when they part in the novel, and they wonder if they are going to see again, and if that can lead to something bigger. A year later, when Beth has passed away and Friedrich comes to court Joe, there is a moment after his first visit where he looks at Joe's picture and he kisses it. And he imagines Joe with her hair loose. In the 19th century, loose hair was a sign of um, open sexuality. I know I have some great asexual listeners who appreciate Joe and Friedrich the way they are, but I think we can all agree that that is not an asexual behavior. Like... An asexual person would not think somebody <laughs> in such ways. Earlier on that same day when Freddy comes to Joe, Joe is so happy to see him. She observes him when he's talking to Joe's father. And just like when they were in New York, Joe is checking him out. She pays attention to his big hands and his fine forehead and his eyes. And then she begins to think why he is there. And then she thinks that, oh, maybe he actually came to see me. And then she gets all flushed. Quote from Little Woman Chapter Surprises. Dear old fellow, he couldn't have got himself up with more care if he had gone wooing, said Joe to herself. And then a sudden thought born of the words. 
made her blush so dreadfully that she had to drop her ball and go down a drift to hide her face. This entire chapter is written this way, how either Joe is lusting over Frederick or he is thinking of her in more intimate ways. Once again, Joe doesn't sound like an asexual person or somebody who is not into men. And if you read Louisa May Alcott's journals from the time when she was in her early 20s, she has a diary marking where she describes a similar encounter. So either there was somebody who came to, quote, woo her, or it was somebody who came for a visit, her family, and then the author, in this case, fantasized that he came to woo her. You do find a great deal of fake news and false information from Little Woman Studies, Many of them inspired by films like the 2019 Little Woman, where everything that happens between Joe and Frederick is ignored. Victorian society was very different, and when the part 2 came out, it received backlash because it handled Joe's sexual awakening, and that was not considered appropriate because he went allowed to speak those things aloud. In Little Woman, there are lots of scenes of Joe and Freddy kissing and making out, which we will discuss more in the course of this podcast. But even if you think about the moment in the Under the Umbrella chapter, Joe kisses Freddy, and the narrator says that she would have done it even if the birds on the fence had been people. And that was considered very scandalous in the 19th century because you were not supposed to show physical affection in public. I have read some speculations from Alcott biographies that actually Louisa herself was a very passionate person and perhaps a very sexual person as well, but the sexual encounters with men are censored in her journals by her and you had to be very careful during those times because there wasn't any kind of birth control. That was also one of the reasons why romantic love and sex became more intertwined with marriage, whereas before marriages were made because of money and property and in some countries i know that sometimes women were not allowed to inherit their father so the money would go to the nearest male relative or they would only get a small percentage of their father's inheritance that's why they were pressured to marry more wealthy men i don't know how it was in america but i know that was the case at least in uh, victorian england In the 19th century, readers imagined Joe to be pretty and then they wanted her to end up with Laurie because he was more conventionally attractive. People in the 19th century were obsessed with this idea of Joe and Laurie being pretty and young and in love and they didn't want to see them to grow. And there are lots of lots of lots of millions of little woman fans who still feel this way. Most of them are pretty young, but I have come across women who are way older than I am and still say that Joe should have end up with Laurie because he was handsome and rich. In the novel, Cho is not written to be very attractive. And I found this quote from Louisa May Alcott herself, where she puzzles why readers ignore what she has written. Quote, Why people will think Cho is small when she is described as tall? I don't see it. Why insist that she must be young when she is said to be 30 at the end of the book? End quote. That was a quote between Louisa and the Lucan sisters, who were fans of hers. Here's a bit more about their correspondence. Quote, Younger and more naive readers than the Lucan says, the oldest Lucan sister would have been closer to 20 at the time of this exchange with Alcott. Sometimes completely failed to understand Cho as a fictional character. They address the author both as Cho and Miss Alcott. People insist on seeing themselves in Cho, and maybe it is because of the movies, we seem to go more further and further away from the novel. Things like Joe's sexual awakening and her love for Friedrich and then the desire to have a brother in Laurie so she can have some of that, quote, male freedom. Those things are literal disguises about the things that happened in Louisa May Alcott's life. But even more than that, Joe represents her values and morals and what she thought was important in life and the transcendentalist views on personal growth, which is something that a lot of people don't like to pay attention. I'm actually quite fascinated by the transcendentalist. That's why I like to talk about them a lot. Louisa May Alcott was 33 when she wrote Little Woman. Why people don't want to see Joe growing up, I don't know. In the novel, it is really Laurie who is holding her back. And there is the contradiction. 
Louis liked to hang out with the younger men, but being in a relationship with one when you don't romantically love them and you have this maternal nature that's not so simple. Then there are these older men who she was into. I recently bought myself a new set of essays that handle Louis's and Henry's relationship. I'll keep you updated if I find something new. And I read this quote from 1933 where it was said that, quote, Alco did have multiple romantic affairs during her life, but they are not meant for prying eyes. When it comes to this podcast, that train went by a long time ago. I think we actually have quite a lot of information about Louisa May Alcott's love life and possible sexual encounters. I started my research studying the real-life Frederick and the real-life Laurie, and that's where I found them. And I hope there is going to be more increasing interest towards that topic. Unfortunately, because when you get people like Reda Gerwig saying that all of these relationships in Little Women are nonsense, just because she didn't like the way Frederick looked like, that creates lots of difficulties in the research because then people don't pay any attention to what happens in the novel. Joe most definitely found Frederick very attractive. Like, read the chapter Surprises and chapter Friend, the chapter where Joe goes to New York for the first time. They are filled with this long description how Joe thinks Frederick is hot. And they continue the sequels. In Little Man, there's the afterglow scene, then there's the making out scene. Then in Charles Post, there are tons of making out scenes. When in doubt, go back to the novel. <laughs> I have a new account on Instagram if you want to come and follow me and get more Little Woman content. You can find it at Podcasting Little Woman. I'm also giving away some free months to Skillshare. If you want to learn to paint or write or learn some other new skills, you can do that on Skillshare and the link is in the description. Today's fanfiction is really a Joe and Friedrich fanfiction classic. This is the Bridal Tour written by Delphi. If you are like me and you frequently read Little Woman canon based fanfiction, you might have come across with this before. I just love it. It's perfect and it goes perfectly along with everything that we have been discussing here. This is Small Umbrella in the Rain, Little Woman podcast, dramatic reading of the Bridal Tour. Enjoy! The Bridal Tour Scenes from the Honeymoon In the immortal words of Augustus T. Snodgrass, Never write what you know. Jo has spent her share of passionate nights, or at least the traumatic evenings prior and tragic mornings after. Her overwrought heroines have threatened to throw themselves over cliff sides and ship rails to escape clutches most gaddish. Her murderesses bury secret marriages along with their late husbands. Lovers commit indiscretions so shocking they cannot be put to paper or indeed be fully pictured by their author. There are no pricking palms in her stories, no toes curling anxiously in the maiden's shoes as she sits on the edge of the bed, biting her lip. Neither hero nor villain has ever fumbled with a match hissing when he burns himself trying to light the lamp. Certainly no one has ever laughed, him with fingers in his mouth and eyebrows bowing in self-depreciation, and her with a sudden breath of relief that he eases the giddy tension in her chest. She can't even recall if she ever made a fictional suitor smile, but Fredericks is warmer than the lamplight. Joan, he says, his voice hushed and tender as he joins her at the bedside. It's surely writing to leave a dialogue hanging, but instead of replying she takes hold of his collar, at the slightest tuck, he leans down obediently to kiss her, and when she lies back, it is with inevitability of a book falling open to a well-out page. There's nothing to fear, Mommy said, frank enough to make those New York sporting men blush when she sat Joe down for the marital talk. It's all perfectly natural. You must make him your confidant, and he must do the same with you. Be honest with him. If he doesn't listen to you, you are not marrying the right man. Yes, he asks, his hand on her waist. Her body answers as readily as her wits. Oh, yes. It's very quick at first, Meg told her. Pride loose from propriety, very late at night in the name of older sisterhood.
over before you know it, all in passion. It isn't, though. It's deliciously slow. Freddy kisses her generously, holding her close to him. His smile is hot against her own, and yet it makes her shiver when it ventures to her cheek, to her ear, to her neck. tighten as they rub against her chemis, and something flutters in her stomach far below the navel. He unbuttons her dress with an ease she never expected of a man, his hands perfectly steady, as hers clumsily attack his waistcoat and shirt, her shoes fall carelessly to the floor, then his steady hand is under her skirt, and that flutter sharpens to something nervous and hungry. He follows the seam of her stocking settles on her tie for what feels like an eternity and then lightly touches her between her legs the air leaves her chest and goes dizzily to her head she has given herself that sensation squeezing her tights together alone in bed at night but this is deep waters to those shallows the sound chirps in in her throat as his fingers move back and forth only lightly at first and then with persuasive pressure that makes her run embarrassingly excitingly wet she is dimly aware of his attention in between kisses his gaze on her face which feels frozen in blushing stupefaction oh she says and oh and yes and oh and then her eyes are squeezing shut and she gasps clinging to Friedrich's shoulders as something winds unbearably tight inside her and then shudders exquisitely free question of anything else as she forget ahead with her plans Friedrich following behind making notes and carrying anything heavy there is so much work to do turning a house into a school buying what needs to be bought making what can be made and making do with everything else besides there is no place on earth more beautiful than Concord in the autumn. It delights her to show Friedrich the sight so dear to her again after her time in New York, and to see them anew through his eyes as he admires the changing leaves and the quiet brooks. Some day they'll go to Europe, they agree, some day when they have the money. For now, she has Europe here with her, in Friedrich, and in his books that have come with him all the way from Berlin shakespeare goethe and kant fill the empty spaces around aunt march's state collection and overflow the library pooling on every surface from the breakfast table to the window sills <laughs> stuffed with notes and stray pens and ribbons as bookmarks i am not a very good housekeeper chose was forced to confide looking around at the little island of clean space we'll manage Friedrich says and gamely starts to pick up a few of the books, ferrying six back to their rightful places before the seven captures his attention. He pauses on the stairs, the sunlight in his hair, as he distractedly reads one page and then another. She gathers her own armful and watches him, unable to keep the smile from her lips. Practice makes perfect. Her legs wrap around his waist, her arms breaking out in goose flesh at the silent O on his lips and the way his eyes close as he presses inside her. She arches her back, her knits tilting up until she's closer to rubbing just right against him. He stops, reaches his arm under her knee. Bodies, it seems, can understand each other too. Low with me on the grass, loose the top from your throat, Freddy reads, speaking softly, savoring mr whitman's verses not words not music or rhyme i want not custom or lecture not even the best only the la la like the hum of your vault voice the goat 
Rain is coming down briskly, tapping on the roof above the quiet house. A fire crackles. Friedrich's chest rises and falls beneath her palm as she reclines on the couch with him, her head on his shoulder. I mind how once we lay such a transparent summer morning, how you settled your head athwart my hips and gently turned over upon me and parted the shirt from my bosom bone. Her fingertips follow the line of buttons down his chest. She bites her cheek to suppress a laugh as she reaches his lap. His voice catches and plunge your tongue to my bare strip heart. She touches him very lightly until he shifts beneath her. Is that the end of the poem? She asks innocently when he makes no attempt to continue. He sets down the book. It's one of his unfinished works. His hands are wonderful, confident, but gentle, always warm. He watches her face when he touches her, pausing when she shivers, only going when she leans closer to more, and his mouth. She trembles like she's had too much strong coffee the first time she sleeps under the covers. His hands, warm and wonderful, spread her tights apart. His mouth is on her breasts, and then between them, and then on her navel. She laughs throwing her stomach in at the tickle of it before the sudden revelation of his intentions. Her hands tighten on his shoulders, and he pauses. She can feel his breath against her lip, a silent questioning. Yes. She pauses too, a long and hot-faced moment passing as she considers it, her grips relents. She strokes the back of his neck. His mouth is hot and entreating, and she blinks up at the ceiling in a surprise at the sensation. His tongue slides over her, and she gasps, again and again, and then his fingers are touching her too. Soon her legs are over his shoulders, and her head is pressing back into the pillow, and she can hear the low muffled sound of his moan, along with the wicked wetness of his low kisses. Oh, she sighs, grabbing hold of his hair. Yes. She adds her share to the household clutter of paper with a flurry notes, curriculum plans, snippets of poetry, and ideas for her next book. Friedrich usually falls asleep after the marital act, but she always finds herself wakeful up afterwards, her mind buzzing with the ideas. The candle stop perch on her writing desk sputters when Friedrich stirs and stretches, sitting up in bed, looking at her with sleepy fondness. I'm almost finished. She whispers, but he gets up anyhow. She hears him rummage around in the dark side of the bedroom before he returns with his dressing gown. There's a moment's pause as he reads over her shoulder with a hum of interest, and then he kisses her cheek. He drapes the dressing gown over her shoulders, tucks it warmly around her, and then sets a second can. Take your time. Thank you for joining me today. Take care and make good choices. Bye.